in a slightly different location today. Uh, I thought I'd move us over here just because I just thought it'd be different. Uh, look, oh look, it's me and Nadia getting married. Oh, isn't that sweet? Um, how are we all? How are we all? I'm so tired. I had four hours sleep. I looked at my sleep app or my Fitbit and it says I've had 15, no, I'd had nine hours sleep across three days. No, nine hours sleep over three days. Crazy, crazy. First of all, thoughts to New Zealand. Obviously, um, there was the earthquake. I'm not entirely sure whether it ended up being as dangerous as I hope it hasn't been. Um, but um, uh, it did break. We, the, I got the news alert last night and then Nadia did a members live. And I think there were people in, in New Zealand who were unaware of it themselves, but felt felt the shake. So... I think there was a tsunami warning and all that kind of stuff. But I think I'm hoping and I'm not seeing it's not on the news this morning. So that's good. Um, Trevor, I saw your comment earlier regarding drink. Um, yeah, a really tough time, man. A really, really tough time, especially if you've gone. I mean, in, a, in many regards, if you went into this crisis sober, you'll have had the tools for sobriety, if you know what I mean. But if you went into this crisis um, not in recovery, not sober, and, um, you know, you've doubled down on things for quite understandable reasons. I think one of the most important things to say is don't beat yourself up for making mistakes. Do you know what I mean? And it's something else about general recovery. You know, it's one day at a time. And, you know, if you drop the ball or make a mistake or feel like you've gone to excess in some way, morning Zoe, um, you, it's really important you don't just double down on yourself um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of, you know, you'll make things worse. You'll put, you put yourself under a pressure cooker situation. So tips for today, if you're doing that, you know, always get out, go for a walk, phone a friend. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, check out the Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, website, go online, there are a search sobriety, sober groups, Instagram. There are so many groups that you can reach out to who will be able to talk to you and help. AA obviously offers a sort of very historic and long-standing sort of in infrastructure of support. There will be Zoom meetings that you could attend or go to, so long obviously as you have a, uh, a laptop. So you can do it, Trevor. You absolutely can do it. One day at a time, one minute at a time, one hour at a time, whatever it takes. Um, distract, distract, distract. We are in unprecedented times, though things are coming to an end. Um, hit the thumbs up, guys. You're right. Someone just said 10 thumbs down and we haven't even said a word. It clearly shows the agenda. It clearly shows the agenda. Um, so, Jane Bentley, minute by minute, hour by hour. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's really crucial. It's really crucial that you don't do this thing. One of the things that I did in early sobriety, and we'll get off this in a minute. I just want to say this is a bit of is that we sort of assume that if we make a mistake in a day, that whole day's gone. It's like if you eat something you shouldn't eat at a certain point of the day and you feel like you've come off a diet, you kind of throw the whole day down the swanee. Your day can start now. It can be, you know, from now. It doesn't have to be 24 hours. There's no one with a clipboard checking it and ticking it off and going, oh yeah, you've done 24 hours. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just, there's, there's negotiability around all of those things. Good morning, everyone. Denise Nelson Gale. Hi, Denise. How are you, my darling? I hope you're well. Thank you so much for sending Nadia's photo back. It was of Nadia, by the way. I hope we said that. Um, Jacqueline Frost, Annie Brown, Ellen, Gabrielle, Ellie Clark, Emma McDonnell, Raspberry Mojito Girl, Alice Cooper. I'm presuming you're not the Alice Cooper. Uh, Jane Bentley, minute by minute, hour by hour. Emma McGregor, um, Tina Davis, thank you. Sharon Smallwood. Charlotte Roberts, uh, good morning everyone. I've been doing some art and writing this morning, feeling so much better now. That's very true. You know, do something that takes you out of... One of the things, it's a, it's a great phrase, I think Nadia's uh, using it up for her T-shirt, stinking thinking, you know, just try and escape the stinking thinking. Just try and escape the stinking thinking because if you stay in your head for too long, and you'll find this in all cases. This isn't just about alcoholic. It's about getting through lockdown. You know, I'm at my worst when I stay in my head. I'm at my worst when I stay just in my head. Take yourself out of yourself, whether it be physical, whether it be practical, drawing, art, something like that. Just take yourself out every day. So it's a much earlier um, coffee moaning this morning. I've got a lot planned from um, 10 o'clock, in fact. So if I have to dash off, it's just because I have to let, let someone into the garden. 
um, and they're on their way now. So there's that, and then I've got two Zoom calls to do. So I thought I'd get this in early, so at least it was there for us all, for you, for you all to have a watch if you've missed be watching it live. Um, Sarah Davis loving the new angle. It's kind of right up my nostrils though, isn't it? <laughs> well, I love that. It's me and me and Nad's getting married there. Um, so what was I going to say? What was I going to talk about? How are you all? Um, someone just mentioned the comment, made a comment, last day of homeschooling. And of course, for a vast majority of people, today is the last day of having to homeschool. It's not our last day. It's our 60 millionth of 7,000 million and 204. But um, yeah, I mean, lots of kids, obviously most kids, if not all kids, going back to school on Monday. Um, Gaynor, you're absolutely right, foodaholic, which is a nightmare, it's an addiction too, you're absolutely right, we talked about that yesterday, Gaynor, about how food gets very forgotten um, within, within discussions around addiction and compulsive behaviour. 4am um, here in Orlando, Florida, hello, LJ Hart 4, hello into Florida, hello Florida. Um, so yeah, last day of homeschooling. Emma McDonald, we home ed anyway, always have none of our classes are going back, so nothing much changing for you. No, nothing much changing for us either until September. But yeah, I mean, spare a thought. I think, you know, a big sort of round of applause to um, teachers, uh, homeschoolers, um, educators everywhere who've had to make learning happen online, distance learning, parents who've had to kind of feel like they've had to put on the parenting cap. I have to confess, I find homeschooling with the girls, it re-educates me. I mean, why would one not want to know everything again? It's great. So I just find that I have a genuine hunger to relearn and then that sort of helps. I mean, it is, it is a big way of doing it. It's like, if you can make yourself care about what you're learning with your kids, you're gonna end up being able to help them with it if they hit if they hit struggles. I would also recommend if you have a child, and this is a top tip really, if you have a child who struggles when they get back to school, say they go to school and they do a lesson on, I don't know, uh, photosynthesis, and they're struggling with it at school, come home, talk to your child, ask them what it was, and then go straight to the Oak Academy and do their lesson on it too, as a sort of way of backing up. Then they get sort of double lolly. And it's always good to get more than one teacher's approach because different teachers approach things in different ways. I mean, we've just on the Oak Academy, there are several different science teachers. We like some of them more than we like others. Some do it in a more sort of progressive and, do you know what I mean? So I think just because you're going back to school, it doesn't mean your kids suddenly need to feel like they're just let go of. Because they really, look, they, you know, the fact of the matter is, as soon as you go to school, you're in a class with 30 other kids, there's a lot more distractions, there's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to get your individual needs heard as a child, if you're struggling, especially. Um, just a thought, just, just, just a top tip. It's something I was saying to Kiki, you know, even when she goes back to school in September, you know, I will, we will always be there in the evenings to support her learning. You know, you know we're not just going to send her and just go, Wee. Um... Charlotte Roberts, so yes, we will be doing things with her from home in the evenings if she needs to and if she, you know, usually where she's struggling with her subjects, if she's struggling with a subject. So, um, Ellen, your teacher makes such a difference, of course, and it's never a criticism of the teaching, um, of the teaching, not industry, but the teaching sector to say that sometimes you can get bad teachers. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you, you can get bad teachers. It's just, just a fact. Um, Elsa Pop, I'm sure when kids go back to school, we'll see another small wave of cases. I think we have to accept that there is going to be, I mean, you know, all the prayer, all the, all the news is kind of like, there's a little rising here, is it rising here? It is going to rise. It's like, I've found this the most frustrating part of the news coverage of this whole crisis, the way in which news headlines are, are land as if they're news. It's not news that when you go into lockdown, the numbers go down. It's not news that when you come out of lockdown, the numbers will go up a bit. That's not the news. And I think, you know, it's a dereliction of duty by the, by the news gatherers when they try and pretend it's news. It's just, no, we understand that. We're all sensible, human, intelligent humans. Um, yes, Dawn, she does. Yeah, she has bits of it, Maddie. She comes in and out of certain parts of homeschooling, absolutely. We don't have a system or a rule. We, don't, we are not a rules-based household when it comes to education. We're not slavishly attached to every part of the system because we believe that some parts of the system don't represent some children. So for example, when I was at school, I was the only boy in my class to go to university. And that seemed quite, quite a thing. Most of my friends at school, and this was back in 87, 86, most of them 
left school, not having got particularly good O-levels, if any, and went into work. No one stood in judgment of that. We now have this idea that children need to be in education forever. So, you know, with our girls, it's a different approach for, different, for each of them differently. And Maddie's will be slightly different. She's probably not going to go on to do A-levels and stuff like that, but she still wants to go on and learn and things like that. So you know what I mean? It's, it's about people get very threatened and, and rattled if anyone does things differently. But all people are different. And we never, ever blanched. I remember I didn't blanch in the 80s. I felt a little bit envious, actually, of those friends of mine who were like, no, 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 I'm going to go off and I don't know, do an apprenticeship or I'm going to go, I've got a work placement or I'm going to work here or I'm going to work there. You know, we also, this is a curious one, we love to champion people like Alan Sugar, self-taught, self-starters, people who proudly state in their CV, I dropped out of school early and achieved stuff. We love to champion them after the event. But if someone's doing that, people get really rattled by it, don't they? Get really, what, what, why, why, she can't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't affect your children. Whatever we do with Maddie doesn't affect your child. Whatever we do with Kiki doesn't affect your child. Just do what, what's good for your child. Everyone is doing what's good for their children. Do you know what I mean? Yes, Brenda McGee, there you go. Rachel says, it's a good point. And well, it is a good point. I think it's a really valid point. I think, we, I think things have shifted so much in time that we assume that children should just be in education for as long, you know, for this allotted amount of time. Actually, you know, sometimes if you want to get out of education and into the world and start working and uh, pursuing a dream, but using work as leverage to pursue that dream, that's sometimes a much more meaningful contribution to society than staying in education because someone somewhere says that's the right thing to do. That's just... You know, it's just my thought. It's just curious because I think Nadia and I always find it really amusing. We talk about it in our confessions of a modern parent. That when you talk about homeschooling your kids, people get really, some people, some people, not all, but some people get really angry. It's quite odd. You know, I wouldn't bowl into a boarding school and say to all the parents of those kids, well, they wouldn't be there because at boarding school, and say, why did you have kids if you sent them all away? It's okay, it might be what I think, but I'm not going to go in and sort of have a go. You know, we know people who send their kids to boarding school and they're great parents. Every child is different. Every home is different. There has to, there is a system. There's a system out there, but there's also systems behind the system. Do you know what I mean? Louise Birchall, this room is so calm and peaceful. It is, isn't it? It's quite tranquil. And look, see, hang on, let me see if I can, it's really hard to point. There's tits in that there box. That there box is a tit box. Tit box. 47 and went back to school. LJ Hart thought that's a good point. Learning is for life, not to pass a GCSE. We are humans, we're not machines. Tits to you too, Don Clerico, sorry. I have to get the word tits into everything, don't I? It's terrible. Um, Sue Wood, I came out of school with nothing, but now I'm doing a college class online. Yeah, <laughs> the other interesting thing about all of this, just and then we'll shut up, I suppose it's, it's relevant because kids are going back to school. There's this assumption that school is the, the healer and the answer. The school system works for the vast majority of kids, though I hasten to add when I say that, what does work mean when, it, when we say it works for them? Um, lots and lots of kids don't flourish at schools. We accept that some kids come out of school without the grades they wanted, but we don't talk about that, do we? We don't talk about the fact that, oh, I mean, we're not allowed to say, all oh, the school system's failing if that happens. We're not allowed to say that. It's just, everyone just needs to get a little bit off their high horses, be a little bit more flexible, and we all have to trust that the vast majority, not all of us, but the vast majority of people are trying to do what's best for their children. Uh, that's a good point. Emma Bev, 66 Carter, I learned so much more when I left school. I have two, and I did really, in inverted commas, well at school. But all of my major learning has happened after school. All of my crafts and skills came from the jobs that I did rather than anything I learned at school. <clears throat> John Brannan, I was crap at school, hated it, left school at 17, straight into work, just retired, never had a day at work. John Brannan, thank you very much. And your point is a really good one, came straight out of school. When you came out of school and went straight into work, no one stood there po face going, why aren't you doing your GCSEs and your A-levels? Why aren't you going to college one second?
Did they, John? Penny Rose, yes, I understand that. However, a lot of managers at work judge on your education, on your CV, which is very frustrating. They do, but not all. And many jobs um, don't require you to have got degree. I mean, you know, there comes a point when, when I was recruiting for the, the company, you know, we, I would avoid people who trained in the area of television. I wasn't after anyone who worked, who, who trained how to make television. You can't teach it, it's just instinctive. You know, I, I would go for people who'd done other things. I'd go for, I remember having a brilliant employee who was, she was a hostess in a number of bars in London and she ran the, she ran this sort of great client list and she just struck me as incredibly, you know, so it's the exception rather than the norm. You know, of course, you know, the vast majority of places work within that system, but that doesn't mean you can't work in a different way. It doesn't mean that at all. Um, anyway, what was I going to say? NHS. So if you look at things, the, the, the government have recommended a 1% pay rise for the NHS. What do you think of that, guys? What do you think of that? And Archie, you'll be great. I know you will. It'll be good. Sad, isn't it? 1% insult, Mo Power. Jacqueline Clements, disgusting. Ellen Jane, disgusting, out of order. Whoopster, UK Balfour. 1%. Their argument, here's the argument. So what do you think of this? I mean, you know, it's easy to take a very quick position. Of course, my initial position on it is, is ghastly, given everything that the NHS has done in this crisis. How could you even get there? Especially a 1% pay rise when everything is pointing towards inflation going up, which essentially means it will end up being a pay cut because the cost, inflation simply means the cost of things around you go up and your pay rise isn't attached to that. So essentially, in terms of your pocket, because of your expenditure, you're worse off per week, okay? You do get the 1% pay rise, but it just doesn't, you don't feel it because the cost of life goes up by more than 1%. Um, Disgraceful Zoe Shah, I worked for a supermarket and got a 3% bonus and a 0.5% pay rise, again, because of the private sector, I guess. Now, the government's argument is, is that they can't do more because of the size and scale of the NHS. And also that actually, yes, no, Russ Souch, if you start comparing to professional footballers, we're in a, we're in a, getting a pickle, don't we? Um, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, no, so the size of the payments to the NHS uh, would be huge, but, but also their argument is that the vast majority of people in the private sector, not the vast majority, that a huge number of people in the private sector haven't even got jobs, whereas many members of the NHS have pensions, sick pay, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of, you know, there's kind of, you know, there are securities within it. I just think there needed to be some notional uptick acknowledgement that was more than 1%. I think, the, I think the figure of 1% just looks horrific, especially when you look at, I mean, here's, here's another interesting, here's an example of how inflation is working already. So obviously huge numbers of people are gonna be um, placed, uh, are gonna be encouraged back into the office, are gonna be traveling back on trains, uh, are gonna be paying an enormous amount of money to do that. But the cost of traveling in on a train is also gonna go up by 5%. So, People who have suddenly found themselves better off working from home, of, yeah, we're going to have to accept that they're going to be worse off by getting on the train, but we're also going to have to pay even more. Um, Anastasia Alexander, I don't know why we're surprised. The Tories are deliberately running the NHS into the ground so they can justify selling it. Stop clapping and start voting. Well... You know, it's been a long, long, long running argument that, you know, the privatisation of the NHS is happening by stealth. I mean, there is a, it's a bit like the BBC. I've always, you know, having worked for the BBC for many years, I've always believed in the idea of the licence fee, but things change. And I think we're now in a situation where the licence fee needs to be reconsidered. It's an enormous cost for the vast majority of people. Unfortunately, I hate to say this, the BBC isn't a guarantee of quality in the way that it used to be. And I think an element of choice and the way in which viewing habits have shifted and changed, it means that we should change those things. So, so that's fair enough. Um, you know, one has to interrogate how you keep such an enormous thing going with an ever-expanding population, an ever-aging population, crises like this coming along. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah, questions are to be asked about funding. Um, 
And I just sometimes wonder whether we're going to move towards what they have in America, which is, you know, more and more private health care policies for people and things like that. Uh, Lindsay Gamble, I've worked for the NHS for 26 years and always love my job. However, these days I struggle to walk into work every day. Oh, sweetheart. And we appreciate, we, you know, God, it's like, yeah, I mean, my granddad, he, you know, he had so many coronaries and he was so looked after by the NHS. I remember having, when I was a really politicised student, I remember be, being really like, Dad, how can you vote for the Conservatives? They're running down the NHS. This was back in the 80s or whatever. What, if it wasn't for the NHS, you wouldn't be here, da, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, there are so many other different sort of issues, aren't there, when it comes to what people vote on. Um, Anastasia Alexander, the, world, the, uh, the American healthcare system is a disgrace. I know, I know. I mean, it, it, it just it lets the most vulnerable fall through, doesn't it? Um, this, I found an interesting story this morning. You know how there's the narrative that most youngsters are breaking lockdown and the rules and all this kind of stuff? And how it's naughty, naughty youngsters and teens that are kind of, you know, breaking lockdown and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I'll be able to find it. Uh, I don't know if I can find the story again. But I just, I just read something saying that actually 41% of over 80-year-olds break the rules, break the um, lockdown rules, or have broken the lockdown rules upon getting their first jab. I don't... I'm not standing here saying anything, you know, but I think it's amusing that we, you know, we've talked a lot on this channel over throughout the crisis about this sort of almost generational conflict where, you know, the older people have wanted to say it's the youngsters' fault and the youngsters are like, oh, God, if it wasn't a few vulnerable people, you know, and there's this idea that there's this spat. But actually, it's n nearly half of all over 80-year-olds have broken the rules. They need to be called out for it just because they're over 80. I think someone just said that. I mean, it, it frustrates me only because it's like we constantly, you know, villainise um, and victimise the youngsters. You know, Jane Bentley, why are teens such a beating stick? I mean, most of the teens I know, all the teens I know, have been incredibly worried and, and troubled and, and, and considered about the whole thing. You know, within a year, we've asked them to stop their youth for a year. Rachel says, we had to explain to my granddad that he still couldn't see us after his first dose of the vaccine. Yeah, it's, it's, some, it's quite a big number. It's like 41% of over 80-year-olds. Um, has anyone seen or does anyone know where one can see? Because there's lots of stories about the new film The Father starring Anthony Hopkins. I, I can't find where I can view it. I want to view it and I want to review it. Um, Zoe Shah, over 80s can claim they forgot, though. <laughs> Uh, rebellious over 80s. I know, it is funny, isn't it? Over 80s rebels. That's what I'm calling them. Gabrielle, lockdown rules have been broken by all ages. I had a row with a friend of mine and she blamed young people. It really annoys me. It does, it annoys me too. You know, yeah, target anyone who's breaking the rules. Obviously, illegal raves and all that kind of stuff. But don't just target, I mean, you know, don't just target the young. Um... Yeah, I want to see The Father. It's the one based on the father who has Alzheimer's. Uh, it stars Olivia Coleman and Anthony Hopkins. Um, I'm looking forward to watching that. Uh, staycations. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of news today about Cyprus is going to be the first place to allow people to visit. It makes you wonder, though, doesn't it? If Cyprus opens their borders... Let me just take a sip of my coffee, guys. If Cyprus opens its borders and allows people in, essentially, with a vaccine passport. I'm worried the island could sink by the sheer weight of people landing. Don't you think? Oh my God, LED. I didn't watch Your Honour, because I was busy last night um, editing, uh, but Nadia did, and she said it was absolutely fantastic, so we are gonna be playing catch up today. Uh, I'm worried Cyprus might sink into the sea because everyone's going to go there. I mean, presumably, as soon as the first... And do you think this is part of the reason this is happening? As soon as the first countries that say that they're open say they're open, do you think everyone there just hikes their prices right up? Because it's what's happening here. Staycation prices are up by something like 37% on this time last year. Um, so like, I think a B&B &B or a hostel or a hotel or something in St. Ives, which would have cost, 
I think something like £70 a night is costing £142 and not £130. I, I don't know, it's quite... Staycations LED are nearly fully booked, but the, the price has gone through the roof. Now, there are two things to that, as Zoe Shah says. Everyone's looking to recoup their money. Um, but I do think that... See, my personal take on it is, even if I could travel around the world this year, I probably wouldn't. Only because I think we've all got this misty-eyed idea of what a holiday abroad was and what it could be. And I don't think, even when you get there, I don't think it's going to be anything like it used to be. It's going to be either overcrowded because it's only one of three destinations. It's going to price, everything's going to be doubly expensive. Um, social distancing will probably be there in some capacity, though not necessarily as much as we think it could be. Um, Geraldine McKeown, Tui, I've moved my holiday to Cyprus from from something this, this May to next May and have charged me an extra 20%. I'm hearing this, a lot of kind of rebookings, getting charged for rebookings. Um, but then even the design, so for me, I think the must go to form of staycation, but I, I, I'm hearing that campsites are also pumping up the uh, the cost. Uh, the Father, March 26, Amazon Prime. Thank you very much, Laura Lauder. Um, it's camping, camping, camping sites. You've got a fixed cost of your tent, it's your pitching, it's where you pitch. But you're right, Faith Goodman, campsite prices have gone through the roof. So, what to do, what to do, what to do. So what are your plans, guys? What are your plans for first holidays? Are you put? It, okay, let me ask a yes or no question. Are you delaying travelling abroad until at least next year, yes or no? Are you delaying travelling abroad, if you travel abroad, until at least next year? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. Ali P, Anne-Marie, Christine Saunderson, Jane Bentley, Steph Coleman, Happy Bernie, Joan Williams, Nicole Marcella, definitely yes. Arch Clark, no. Um, Jackie Knudsen, Hayley Edwards. Okay, here's another question. Are you, is anyone considering, are any of you considering staycationing this year obviously in this country anyone considering staycationing in this country Demitar Rashkov you're longing to get back to the OK Lynn oh Lynn you're probably on someone else's account desperate to get back to Cornwall yes yes we have staycation booked in September Sarah Watkins uh, yeah Nadia's desperate to staycation yes Week in Wales, Karen Bennett, yes. Cornwall New Year's Eve, Deborah Holdsworth. Penny Spearing, book to go to the Isle of Wight. Ah, oh, so my love to, uh, do you leave from Limington? It's not Limington, is it Limington? Yeah, I think it might be Limington. Um, Janet Gorman in Canada, once I've had both jabs by September, possibly. I'm desperate to go to Canada. Iceland is on the green list. Iceland, uh, Cyprus, the Caribbean. Uh, the Seychelles, these are all on the green list. I was, I was looking at that earlier. The green list is where you can travel to. Presumably Cyprus will be on there too. Um, Josephine Bailey, I'd love to visit the UK to see my daughters. Oh, Josephine. Katrina Fratura, I think everyone should wait till next year. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, I don't think, I'm never one for saying anyone should do anything, but I think... I think a lot of people are going to be mightily disappointed. I mean, add into the into the sort of factor into all of this, what is it going to be like at the airports? I mean, if you're happy... I mean, you know, I was saying the other day, there were seven-hour queues, and there's barely anyone travelling into or out of the country at the moment. How's that going to work? We know that even the EU passport quick, you know, fly-throughs never worked. So what are we going to do with new passports, the EU details added into there? Let's not forget that. All that kind of stuff. We're not going abroad this year, no. Um, the airline industry will have to rebuild their finances and staff before anyone travels anywhere. Yeah, I'm right next to the beach here in Cornwall, Lucy Williams. Plenty of beaches on our doorstep. Lucky. Ah, you're so lucky. Um, so the other story that I saw that kind of made me feel a bit nostalgic, actually, was the National Trust's climate change threat. I mean, the story is a bit depressing but basically sort of saying that by 2060, you know, high heat and humidity will really, really impact on the southeast of England, with a third of National Trust sites in the region experiencing 15 days above 30 degrees a year. Storm damage, coastal erosion, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they have, the charity staff are taking action to cope with rising temperatures. 
it's just quite a stark reminder that we think of climate change as, you know, um, I don't know, tornadoes and hurricanes and all that kind of stuff and earthquakes. But it can also happen at a low level. Do you know what I mean? Um, before we went into lockdown, I was talking to a number of people. We were going to do a series of films about uh, people's who people whose homes are on the very edge of the British coastline that are running the risk of sinking in. It's called Life on the Edge. And, uh, you know, just not really, you know, just telling the drama, but also talking to them philosophically about, you know, what watching their the end of their garden come towards their back door, uh, how it makes them feel. I remember filming years ago on the Suffolk coast in a, in a village where numerous houses were just falling into the sea. And I think it's just really important to remember that, you know, um, Climate change can work at a low level too. You know, it can, it can, it doesn't have to be great big events, macro events. It can work in a micro level. And the National Trust has a climate change heat map that they've published. Um, and uh, the head of the National Trust says this map is a game changer in how we face the threat climate change poses. While the data draws on a worst case scenario, the map paints a stark picture of what we have to prepare for. But by acting now and working with nature, we can adapt to many of these risks. And that's about planting things like heat tolerant plants, planting more trees, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Because the thing about tourism and there's a kind of connection here with staycationing, because a lot of us, you know, who staycation end up in National Trust places, don't we? Um, and it's, you know, the very thing that sustains these destinations is the very thing that's destroying them. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I used to call it vandals in sandals. You know, we all mean well when we go, when we go traveling. Um, Mark, you've put pay cut in the title. I thought it was a rise by 1%. No, it is a 1% pay rise, but with inflation, it effectively amounts to an NHS pay cut. So I'm kind of being not ironic because it's not an ironic subject, but I'm kind of stressing the fact that even a 1% pay rise with inflation will end up being a pay cut. Um, water levels rising in New Zealand, ice melting fast. I know. So it's, it's another reminder of David Attenborough's stuff. We have to, we have to, that's right, Jane, we have to be mindful. And yeah, I mean, I suppose you can allow, I think, do we just allow ourselves all the indulgence of just thinking this time we just want to go mad this year and let's just hope for the best and then let's just get back to normal next year so everyone can just run to the beaches and just kind of, you know, just, just do what we do. I don't know. Anyway, guys, hit the thumbs up if you've enjoyed our natter. It's been a it's been a low key one. It's been an earlier one. Um, I've got all sorts of things I've got to do. I've got meeting someone who is working in the garden today, so um, it's all of that. And um, yeah, uh, what's coming up later today? Something I can't remember what. Something is landing on the channel today. I can't remember what though. Um, I've got quite a busy day today, shooting lots of the Sunday show when Nadia's back. So. Um, have a good day, guys. See you over the weekend. Something will land later. Uh, stay safe. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't. Subscribe if you haven't. And uh, take care.